Good morning, everyone. Judging by the, uh, the volume in the room, I think everybody's having an opportunity to meet each other, and I think that's a great harbinger of a wonderful several days here at the CSAE National Conference. How many folks are from somewhere other than Southern Ontario, and this is sort of time number one or whatever? Oh, this is excellent. So folks liking Niagara Falls? For sure, excellent. It's a wonderful venue here. Let me introduce myself. My name's Liz Fisk. Uh, my day job is Executive Director of Distress Centres Ontario, but I'm here uh, introducing our speaker today in my role as a board member for the CSAE Trillium Chapter. Our chapter is very pleased to be sponsoring a group of these educational sessions, and I'm sure my notes here say you will find a gem in this session to bring back to your office. Just chatting with Ed here, I think you're going to have several gems, not just one, so we don't want to undersell this. Um, we want everyone to know that this session is being live streamed to a virtual audience, and welcome to that audience to, uh, to this session. Um, Eve Michelli? I hope I got her name right, is monitoring your participation if you're visiting with us in a virtual capacity, and she will ask questions on your behalf of the presenter as it's appropriate. Um, feel free to leave your cell phones on, but we will ask that you switch them to uh, vibrate or silent mode. And also, please, we encourage you to use the CSAE app, and feel free to tweet and text about how wonderful Ed's presentation is this morning. So let me tell you a little bit about Ed Rigsby. He's the author of The ROI of Membership, Today's Missing Link for Explosive Growth. And he is one of only a few individuals in the world who hold both the CSAE, the CAE designation, and also is a certified speaking professional. He has those credentials from the National Speakers Association. Ed has over 2,000 published articles to his credit. He's also the author of three books on strategic alliance development and implementation. And in addition, he has 25 years of consulting worldwide with both the for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. And his consulting is in the area of return on investment. And he is also the CEO of an American nonprofit charity. He has been an adjunct professor at the California Lutheran University and the University of California at Santa Barbara. I should also mention this, that Ed will be at the CSAE Resource Center to autograph his new book, should you wish to purchase it. They are on hand there, and he will be there after 1.30 this afternoon, so that's after lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Rigsby. Thank you. Good morning. I'm very excited to be here. Are you excited to be here? Well, let's show some emotion. Yeah, do, yeah, whatever floats your boat. Okay. I'm from Los Angeles, so that means I'm from the land of fruit and nuts, so that means you're going to have to, uh, to, to deal with that. Um, just so I understand, who is a chief staff executive in the room? Executive director, CEO, whatever, you know, okay. And who is not? How many, uh, do we have any suppliers in the room, partners, vendors? Okay, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking to you about the key elements from my member ROI summits. I do these full day summits all around uh, North America, I've done a couple up in, uh, three up in Toronto in the last couple of years, and I'm trying to today or this morning, in an hour and a half, I'm going to try to distill the best of a full day. So what that means is I'm not going to be going slow. I'm going to be zipping along pretty quick. So um, if I don't answer every question, it doesn't mean that I'm rude. Well, it probably does, but I don't mean to be rude. I, I've just got some really cool stuff I think I want to, to show you, and I'm going to move pretty quick. The time that they assign me to be in the bookstore to answer questions is from uh, 2 to 3. So are you ready to launch? Yeah, let's just, yeah, let's, let's stop with this. Let's get going. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about the book. And, and really, 
so much of what I'm going to be talking about and where these member RA summits came from, not only the work that I've done in member recruitment, but the work that I've done for the last 25 years in strategic alliance development, in, in the strategy. So it's all come together to create what we're going to do. So with that, they asked me to make sure that you see that the book is available in the bookstore, and that's enough for sales. Now, I have on my wall in my office, I've got a lot of, well, I've got a lot of Mickey Mouse stuff. Yes, I have a Mickey Mouse watch. Um, it, it, but that's because I'm from Los Angeles, so you expect that of me. One of the, th the I've got these three, uh, let's call them placards. And um, on the first placard, there's a picture of Walt Disney standing in dirt and kind of behind it is a half tone of the Magic Castle. And below it, it says vision. And when we look at, as an association executive, you know, I think that it's really important that you have a vision, that you, that you have an idea of where you're going to go, of what's possible for your organization. Because the board, what, comes and goes? And you're the one that stays there. So in, in, in looking at that, where we're going to go with today, I, I would hope, number one, that you do have a vision. The next placard that I have on the wall, it's a picture of Walt Disney drawing, uh, drawing Mickey Mouse and then an overlay of Mickey Mouse looking over the desk watching him. And that one says heritage. And, and I think that one of the hard things that we're dealing with today, all of us, is in our organizations, what do we throw away and what do we keep? And I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Because you do have a lot of sacred cow activities and projects and, and features of membership, don't you? The waste resources, don't you? And it, it becomes a challenge. What do we hold on to? What's important? What do, we, what do we get rid of? With Disney, what would Disney be without the mouse? Not much. So in looking at your organization, what would your organization be without your core? What is it that you're really, really about? And the third placard I have, there's a little picture of Tinkerbell zipping around the Magic Castle. Does anybody have a guess what it says on that placard? This is the audience participation part. <laughs> That's about as much as you're going to get to participate, so enjoy it. Anybody have it? Yes, ma'am. OK, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because you participated, you're going to get so let's do this to everybody else. OK. <laughs> so you get a copy of a book. Even if your answer is crummy, it doesn't matter, because you participated. So what, 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 is your, um, what, what do you think it might say? Belief. Belief, good, wrong, but good. <laughs> is anybody else? Sir? Dream. Dream, close, close, close. Anybody else? Wish, Wish close. Well, who said that? OK, you get a book. Hold on, hold on. Let me, but sorry, to, oh, to the AV guys, sorry guys, I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Who said that? You, okay. Magic, gosh, you were good. Here you go. Yes. All right. Magic, and here's the thing. You, you association executives, you're the magic, aren't you? Whether you're the executive or the staff, you're the magic. But then the question is, are you allowing your volunteer leaders and your volunteers to be part of the magic. Because here's the challenge. Yes, you're the magic. You're the ones that make it happen. But also, you can be a bottleneck. You can keep them from participating and being part of the magic. So in looking as we go forward, here's the thing I'd like you to be thinking about. It's just like with Disney, vision, heritage, OK, where we're going to go, what is possible, keeping what was, what was there. And then the magic is also letting others participate. Sometimes that's a hard call. OK. What we have up here, this is a model that I like to share as far as a, a lifestyle or a life cycle for member recruitment. OK, first, a member is recruited, right? You with me? There, everybody go like the little doggies in the back of the car. OK, good. OK, then. Assimilated. I know, how many of you like the term onboarding better? Two of you. OK, good. I like assimilation. Maybe it's because my wife made me watch Star Trek with her. Remember the board? Uh, what is it? A resistance is futile. You'll be assimilated. So I like the word assimilation because I want members, as they come in, as they're recruited, to start to become part of it. 
not just to be given a membership packet, but to actually become part. Then if they become part, then they get engaged. And it's really all about a member being engaged, not just being, if they're just part of your organization, they may or they may not stay. If they're engaged, they're probably going to stay. If you can keep them engaged, then you're going to get, what's the next one? Retention. And if you can retain them, once members have been, oh, let me just, before I go any further, um, I got full disclosure here. I just came off vacation, and so you got nothing in, in the app from me, your SOL, so my apologies. If anybody wants this PowerPoint presentation, I'll take some of the pictures out because the files are too big. But all you have to do is give me your card. And those of you that are watching this thing streaming, send me an email to ed at rigsby.com. And I'll be happy you know, to give you the PowerPoint presentation. So at the end of this, just write your name. Or just give me a card, write, you know, write PowerPoint or write PPT on it, and within the next couple of days or so, I'll get it off to you. I'm having all kinds of internet problems here in the hotel and in my office, so it might take a couple extra days. But I guarantee you will get it, so don't worry about taking notes. But there are a couple things that you'll have to do as far as uh, writing. So back to this. So if you've got a member that's retained, those are the ones that are the awesome possibilities for becoming evangelists. Because in the final analysis, you want evangelists, don't you? And then those evangelists are going to recruit new members. But you've got to give them tools. And we're going to be talking about that, and that's where most of the day is going to be going. So in looking at all this, there's basically two paradigms of members. And this is, <laughs> I've been talking about this since about the year 2000. And, and here's what I want you to think about. We have the first paradigm which is the givers. The givers are the ones that are going to be part of your organization, no matter how good a job you do, no matter how great or how lousy your meetings are, they're going to come and participate. And don't you love those people? Yeah? Guess what? You, you've, been, you've been lured to the opiate of easy, because a lot of those people are disappearing. And the other paradigm is the takers. And the takers are really the ones that, oh, hope it wasn't one of the people that won a book. Um, I have to take your book back. So the takers, and that it's not necessarily a bad thing. So I don't want you to think about the takers as, as a bad, but they're the ones that tend to be the people that are younger in their career, not necessarily always younger in age but younger in their career, newer in their career. This is where the low-hanging fruit is for you for new members. Would you agree with that? It really is. The challenge in, in bringing the takers into the organization is their paradigm is, show me it's worth my time to come and play in your sandbox. Show me that there's a good return for my investment of dollars and time. Otherwise, I'm too busy because I'll just go Google it and get the information on the internet. How many of you believe you compete daily with Google? OK, the rest of you should really put your hands up. Because whether you want to admit it or not, your trade association or professional society competes with Google and other search engines every day of the week. And if you think Google's bad, try YouTube. Just think how quickly people can get answers. So within that, I think it's real important to understand that the people you're probably going to be recruiting are more than likely going to be the younger people, or meaning younger in their career, than the people that are older in their career. So with that, we've got to look at, OK, how are we going to access them? I think that there's four things that I want you to walk out of here today with. And number one is, can you see your organization through the eyes of the non-member? OK, you are living in your organization every day. You're in the middle of it. You can't see the forest for the trees. You see the value. <clears throat> you understand the value. But you haven't perhaps made the translation for the non-members and have you stopped and stepped outside of your organization and looked at your organization from the outside? 
If you haven't, how in the world are you going to be able to influence the non-members into membership? Number two, I think it's really, really important that you learn how to calculate the return on investment that you deliver. Because as we go forward, the great 70s, 80s, and 90s are gone. <clears throat> no longer are 12 magazines an annual meeting good enough. Would you agree with that? OK. So in looking at this, we have to decide, how can we prove to the non-member that membership is a good business decision? How can we prove to the non-member that membership is a good financial decision? How can we prove to the non-member that membership is a good career decision? Well, one of the ways we're going to have to start doing that through dollars and cents. Next is understanding people don't buy features, they buy benefit. Now, if I were to go to your website, and we went on it together, and we went to your page, that says benefits of membership, okay? If I went to that page, would I read about how things make my life better or would I just have a list of features? I would be willing to bet anybody in the room a book that if we went to your website together, you would have a list of features and you would not have information about how those features make the potentials a member's life better. So we have to learn to start selling the benefit of the feature and not the feature. And then fourth that I'd like you to walk out of here today with is let's look at how do we turn our members into member recruitment evangelists. And you gotta give them the tools. And that's really where we're gonna go with the next probably hour of time that we have together. So let's first start with the difficult thing. Here's the one concept that I'm gonna get into that probably the majority of trade association executives that I work with have the most difficult time with. This slide here is from Marketing General's um, membership benchmark report. If you, just give you a little, little clue for anybody. Go to, if you haven't already, if you don't do it regularly, go to marketinggeneral.com. And if you're willing to give them your email address, every year you can get their benchmark study. It's a great study. You'll get it as a PDF. If you participate in their study, they'll actually mail you the hard copy. So I would encourage everybody, they're, they're a good company. They're a marketing company. I mean, obviously, they're going to try to sell you something. But they're good people. They've got a good study. From this year's study, here's the key point. It says here, what do you believe is the one top reason members join? This is asking association execs. If we look here, and you can see 2014, 2013, 12, 11, 10, the key is, just for discussion now, right here we have advocacy. If we look here, it says 8%. 8% join because of advocacy. Well, what about the other 92%? Let me just ask you this. How big is advocacy and legislative work as far as your association. Just, if, if it's kind of important or halfway important, raise your hand. Okay, a good number of you, would you agree? Okay, here's the challenge. Advocacy is one of those things that is not a member-only feature. It's one of those things that you do that serves the entire industry. I call that an industry stakeholder, feature, activity, benefit, whatever term you want to assign to it. So here's the thing. It's a real challenge. If you want to try to recruit new members, and if you make the mistake of talking exclusively or primarily about advocacy, I was just working with California Medical Association, and they're giving me all their brochures, and they're really, really pretty, and they're gorgeous, and I open it up in the very beginning, this big picture of the California State Capitol. So I'm talking with the guy that, um, um, and I said, well, these are really nice, um, but why are you talking about this? Well, because this is important to our members. And I said, okay, I believe that. But is it important to your non-members? And that's who you're trying to recruit. 
So with your brochure, the first thing you're talking about is let us tell you about the value you, we create. You need to join so we can do more advocacy. And the non-member says what? I get that value already. Why should I join? Well, you need to support your industry. Can't afford it. And then you get frustrated. So the key is that I want you to have a very, very good understanding. Now, you didn't hear me say, nor will I say, that you shouldn't do advocacy and legislative work. That's very important to your, to your current members. But what I want you to hear, please, is that in the area of member recruitment, I'm not talking retention, in the area of member recruitment, if you talk about advocacy and legislative work and all of the things that are industry stakeholder benefit rather than member only, guess what's going on in this non-member's head? What's going on in their head? Yeah, what's going on in their head is, it's real simple. No sale, no sale, no sale. I mean, it's no sale. So within that, here's what you gotta think about. We, we, in the association world, we tend to talk about member recruitment and member retention all in one breath. But I think that if you look up here, it says member retention equals customer service. Okay, retaining our customers, retaining our members, we're doing what they want. And to probably a good majority of your members, some of the industry stakeholder benefit, like advocacy, is very important. Okay, great. No argument, super. However, on the flip side, when we're looking at recruiting members, which is sales, not customer service, that's a different story. We've, if we're going to recruit new members, we've got to prove to them that it's a good business decision. So in this, in this slide, it's just basically, let's talk about measuring. So here's an example, and I'm gonna give you something that's not Canadian, just because I don't want to upset anybody in the room. Um, this is the Texas Medical Association's ROI calculator they have on their website. It's a really nice start, although there's a lot of erroneous things on it. Number one, the numbers were determined by the staff, not the members. Number two, if we go to the next slide, the things that they have listed here, it says advocacy and legal, the big numbers for their return on investment. So premium rate reductions resulting from TMA, Texas Medical Association supported liability insurance reform. That's worth $5,000 a year. Is that a member only benefit or does everybody in the industry get it? Everybody gets it. Same thing with the RICO settlement at $3,400. Same thing with the Texas franchise tax advocacy at $1,700. Here's what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying, not to beat up on these guys, but the point is this. They determined the value, the members didn't. Number two is a lot of the high value they put up there, a non-member will look at that and go, no sale. They're gonna go, I get that anyway. So why should I join? This is a problem. And this is what way too many associations have done for the last several years. We're talking about the things that the members care about, but you're not looking at your organization from the eyes of the outsider, you're looking at your organization from the eyes of the members. That's the big problem. You're talking about what your members care about, you're not talking about what the non-members need to be influenced to join. So in looking at a hierarchy of belief, you and I first believe what we create. We second believe what friends and family create. And we third believe what organizations create. So when an organization creates a member ROI calculator, it's the least believable in the hierarchy. So in looking, here's what I'd like to recommend that everybody in this room consider doing. Consider doing qualitative research rather than quantitative. Quantitative research, like SurveyMonkey, has its place and there's benefit. Qualitative research for determining the ROI of membership is a much richer methodology. It gives you context and everybody has an understanding. You cannot really get a good ROI number if you try to do it with quantitative. You know, quantitative, when was the last time you did a survey and you got disengaged? Last night I was filling out a survey online. I was at the 
the Hyatt Place, Waikiki, really nice property, nice, you know, gave them really good marks. But by the time I got to the last page of the survey, the questions they asked I thought were stupid. It was like, how does this make me feel? I mean, come on. So by that point, I'm disengaged. I'm just putting, you know, five, 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 because I thought it was stupid. Think about yourself. When was the last time you did quantitative and you were disengaged and then you just start buzzing through? With qualitative, people can't get away with that. And so qualitative can be done either with focus group methodology or interview methodology. I just finished up, whoa, I'm about ready to fly off the edge. I just finished a major project with a Canadian association, a national one, where they wanted to do interview process. It costs a lot more money, but that's viable. But for you, here's the idea, for everybody in this room, you can probably do qualitative very inexpensively, and here's how to do it. Number one, think about how you're going to get your group together. What's going to be the sampling? Now, let's say that you've got an association of 1,000 people. Is a sampling of 50 or 75 people reasonable? The answer is you might be thinking no, but the answer is yes, it is reasonable. Because if you get some people from north, south, east, and west, some new members, some, uh, some older members, some senior members, you know, black, white, green, male, female, you know, if you get a reasonable mix in the room, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be reasonable, then you can do some pretty decent qualitative research pretty quick. So, the way it goes is we'd be in a room like this with an audience like this, and then what I'd pop up on the screen is all the features of membership. The various features. It has to be a member-only feature, because if it's not a member-only, no reason to measure it, because it's going to be a no-sell in the marketplace of trying to sell to new members. So we have this whole list of all the features of membership. Then we're going to let the audience look at, okay, is everything that this organization does, is it up on the list? If somebody says, oh, what about this? What about this? What about that? And then we go, okay, is it a member only? If it is, we add it. If it isn't, we don't. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of these features of membership one at a time and discuss with the audience how they might determine the value. As an example, everybody goes, well, how do you figure the value of networking? Okay, simple. You get a bunch of people in the room, you go, well, here's what you do. Let's look over the last couple years, maybe the last five years. And in networking, let's talk about the value you've gotten. Have you uh, uh, learned something that saved you money, that made you money, that saved you time? You know, we go through all these different things and then get people to think in their mind about, okay, that number, that number, that number, and then divide it up over five years. Or if somebody says, well, you know, I, I only get one, and a lot of your members, okay? Well, maybe say, well, you know, every, every two or three years I get, I get a lot of value, but the other years I don't go, okay, great. Take that value, divide it over the years, and that's gonna give you an average. So what we're looking for <clears throat> is for each feature of membership, for your members in the room to give their feedback on what they believe is a reasonable dollar value for that feature, and it doesn't have to be complete agreement. It's just most of the people in the room would say, yeah, I can sell that number. Then we have to look, and we already talked about multi-year, then we have to look at that some of the features of membership, people may list it as zero value, which can kind of like being a knife in the heart to some association people. And then we have to look at, is your organization a individual membership organization, or is your uh, a company? How many people are individual membership organizations? Okay, how many people are company? Okay, so I would say, Two-thirds, just for a quick look, two-thirds are individual and one-third is company. So for company, we've got to look at the value per employee. It's a much, and I'll show you an example in a minute. Then we calculate the numbers. Here is one of the interesting things. When we do this, the reason that nose is up there is because whatever numbers you come up with have to pass the smell test. You know, because if somebody says, well, it's worth a million dollars, no, it isn't. You know, you've got it. And so in doing these facilitations, what you're trying to do is get the people in the room that assemble together to say, okay, realistically, between somebody saying it's worth zero and somebody saying it's worth $10,000, 
where's a number that most of the people in the room could say, yeah, I could sell that number. Yeah, I, I could sit down and honestly talk to somebody and sell that number. That's whether it passes the smell test or not. The other challenge is a facilitator. I'm just going to tell you up front, don't do this yourself. Because every time I get a call from an association exec, well, I tried to do this facilitation and it didn't work. Yes, and like I told you in the session, it's not going to work if you do it. Here's why. You have a vested interest in too many of your features. Down in the, down in the south, down in Georgia, they say, you got, you got a dog in the hunt. So, so the point is, if you do it, if one of your staff does it, or if one of your volunteer leaders does it, they are going to be upset if people value things that really matter to them low. And they're going to show how upset they are, and it ain't going to work. So you've got to get an outsider. Go get a retired, go, to, go get some retired executive somewhere. Uh, teachers usually aren't good because teachers don't listen to feedback. Teachers want to teach. So, but, but whoever you get to do it, the facilitator, it's really, really important that they understand. And the facilitator's got to deal with the different personalities. I don't have time to get into that now. I hate to say go buy the book, but go buy the book. And um, it, it's, it's just real important that the facilitator not be a biased person. And you as a staff person or volunteer leader, you are biased. Here's an example of a, of a ROI evaluation session I did this year. <clears throat> It says up here, this is for an individual group. Now, these are a little bit small, and I apologize for that, but just annual conference discount, $300. Technology education conference discount, $250. Local uh, area education chapter meetings, $45. This is the yearly value this group assigned to it. Annual division meeting discount, $50. You see, it says discount. Here's the thing, your annual meeting if you allow non-members to attend is not a feature of membership. Only the discount that the member gets is a feature of membership. Big difference. Access to IAP headquarters staff, $200. Okay, this one was NA. Webinar discount, $100. We can go through Office Magazine, $32. Newsletter, $50. Uh, come over here. Uh, we had some where affinity programs were zero. A community web directory, $25, member recognition, $250, networking, $5,000. Okay, so you get the point. So we add all of the features of membership. Again, these are member-only features, not industry stakeholder benefit. And it comes to $11,800. This is yearly, every year, because you pay your dues every year. And so then the cost of membership with this group for an individual is $138, plus, it, plus you have to be a chapter member for $20, plus you have to be a division member for $20. So it's a, the real cost of membership is $178. So when we take 11,852 divided by 178, we get $66.58. So basically what this group can say to their members is for every dollar you invest in membership, our members have told us they get $66 back in value. Does that sound like a reasonable ROI? What do you think? This is the audience participation part. Yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Question? Question of hold, hold on. Let me come and speak into my mouth because they're recording this. No, not speak into my mouth. Speak into my chest. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The top two items on the right, I'm curious about the rationale, if you know anything about it, for how they came up with the... The top two items on values for leadership. Leadership, leadership. sure, sure. Yeah. Leadership, here's the thing, if you have the opportunity to be involved in leadership, there's a few things that you get. You will get additional education. Sometimes it can be MBA level, okay? And, and that could be worth a fair amount of money. You get the opportunity to have a lot more exposure in your trade association, which could translate into career advancement and doing more business. You also get to have some influence on the organization's legislative work, it gives you a seat at the table which others don't have. So there's, it's pretty easy to start measuring the value. And so the way we do it is I tell somebody, okay, if you've been through the leadership cycle once and say, okay, I've been a member for 20 years. I went through leadership and I was five years. Okay, let's talk about all the value you got over those five years. And then let's divide that by the 20 years you're a member and that's how we get those numbers. So that's, 
an example of a recent valuation for individuals. Here's one for a company. And uh, this one, uh, I forgot the name, was uh, a professional assistant group. Okay, this, is, uh, this group was uh, American Council of Engineering Companies. This was the Colorado State chapter. And this is where the company is a member, not the individual. So if we look, and I broke this into basic categories, knowledge management, business solutions, career development. And you can see the various number. This one here, legislative update, 2,500. Now, remember, I said advocacy is not a member benefit, but a legislative update, if you only give it to your members, is. And I will tell you, across North America, that's one of the features of membership that get rated very, very highly. Um, and so as we go through this, it, you see some of these, it's in, it's in green, educational seminars. Well, in that, in that industry, that can be per member. So it's $200, but it can be per member, and, or per employee, I'm sorry, per employee of the company. And then we've got national benefits from the national organization, 150 per employee. Over here, opportunities for leadership per employee. Future leader series per employee. Networking per employee. So when you take and do evaluation for uh, if, you're, if your organization is company membership, then you're going to figure out the value for the first employee. Then you're going to look at well, how many employees in that company may participate. And then we're going to multiply that. And we're going to add that in. So when we look at this, OK, the total average cost of this uh, membership in this organization is $2,500. The total value for the first employee is $22,000. So the first employee would get a nine-time return, $9 back for every dollar investment. However, it says plus additional employee of $8,800 per employee, an average company in that, in that association is 14 employees. OK, so we look at realistically if half the employees take advantage, the first employee um, plus the other six, now we're at $53,000. We divide it out, and it goes from nine times ROI to 30 times ROI when we look at the employee. Because we forget sometimes to say, a lot of the benefit is going to be per employee, because if your company joins, all of the employees get to participate. How many of you that are, that are membership for companies, do most of the employees get to participate? Raise your hand. OK. How many of you that are membership companies where the company's a member where employees don't get to participate? None? OK, so some didn't raise your hands. OK, so you got the idea? Is that a yes? I'm looking, some eyes are looking a little bit glazed. I know, I'm throwing a lot at you, but let me throw some more at you. OK, for, for the book that, that we talked about, I put down, I, I, I've averaged the valuations I did from 2000 to 2012. And on an average of the valuation from 2000 to 2012, it says up here $7,100 is what the people said that their trade associations gave them in business solutions. $3,900 is what, this is per year, is what their associations gave them in professional development. $2,700 in networking and $2,400 in knowledge management. Now, don't publish these numbers saying your organization gives because that's not valid. But this is just an indication to give you an idea of the average of what all of the organizations had put out there. Now, this knowledge management here, this is an area for tremendous growth for everybody. And, you know, I don't have time to get into it a lot, but I'll just tell you there's probably a lot of things that you've got on your website free that shouldn't be. But that's another discussion. This is up here, and I'm going to put these, I'm going to go through some of these quickly, but the reason I want you to pay attention to this is I'm going to have you do a little exercise in just a minute or two, and you're going to want to think about the features of membership that your organization delivers, because you're going to need to be thinking of those. So in looking at these, the, the actual value doesn't matter as far as our discussion now. These were the averages, you know, it's more for you just to have an idea. But affinity programs, training, um, safety programs, access to headquarters staff, innovative business and practice solution, cost savings, uh, an opportunity to find new suppliers, cost saving finding new employees, legal seminars, a lot of trade associations give legal help free, uh, product knowledge gained through meetings, credibility with customers, on and on and on, business, business development, 
um, special interest groups, access to uh, resources at the national level or at the chapter level, depending, Develop career development opportunities, um, participation in leadership, certifications, study groups, peer groups, so forth and so on, knowledge management, publications, printed, you know, email, e-zine, e printed, legislative updates, member-only sections on your website, industry standards and codes, so forth and so on. These are the various features of membership. Your organization offers features of membership. You're going to, I mean, in just a minute, I mean, you think about member-only features of membership. So here's the thing. You can go, your group, you can go through and do the qualitative research to determine, okay, all of our features of membership are worth X, 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 X. Our total you know, value is Y. We divide it out. And so you can say, our members get you know, $27 back for every dollar they invest. Great. If, if you do that work and you're a happy camper with it and you think, yep, yeah, that's great, we're, we're, we're awesome, we're doing great, then you go straight from creating your number down to publishing and creating a campaign. However, if you say, well, you know, I, we maybe could do better. You know, I mean, we've got the numbers, but uh, I bet we could do some improvement here before we, you know, we start putting it out. Well, then you can go in to do some strategic work, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, and then go over to publishing. So if, if you think your, your organization is totally awesome right now, um, you can zone out for the next couple minutes while we go through the strategic work. If you think that your organization could improve a little bit, then let's talk about the strategic work. Okay, so in growing your ROI, we want to look at it. We're going to have you do a little exercise here. So draw yourself on your piece of paper. Draw yourself four quadrants. And I'm going to, here's, here's the key I want everybody to hear. Please hear this. I'm going to, we're going to do a couple exercises, and it's not how good you do the exercise. That doesn't matter. What matters is how well you learn the process. Because you can go back into your office and do the exercise. So when I'm, I'm going to take you through it very, very quickly. When we do these all-day all things, we have plenty of time to really get into it deep, but we don't have. But I want you to understand the process. You can go back and do it. So just burn through it. Don't obsess. Nobody's going to look at yours. You know. So here's what I want you to do. Draw four quadrants. On the... Um, on the uh, vertical axis, the top is going to be high, the bottom is going to be low, and that's going to be how your members perceive the value of your various features. And the horizontal axis, to the left is low, to the right is high. And hey, any of you that are, that are there watching on streaming, don't be lazy, do this too. I mean, don't go get a cup of coffee, just actually do this. It's going to help you. So then what you're going to do is cost to the organization. So on the horizontal axis, to the left, low cost of the organization, to the right, high cost of the organization. On the vertical axis, to the top, members perceive the feature as high value. On the bottom, members perceive it as low value. Now write down just a few of your features of membership. Make yourself a little list, like 1 to 5, 1 to 10, whatever you have time to do. And just write some various features of membership. And then after you write those down, you know, number it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever, then plot on the uh, graph where it fits. And just put the number. Put number one fits here, number two fits here, number three fits here. So whatever you perceive, and, and again, don't obsess. Just do it quickly. Learn the process. Don't worry about how well you implement right now. That's not the important point. I'll give you just a couple minutes. And again, for you at home, we're sitting there watching, you know, like, do this, don't be lazy. And for you at home, hey, send me a, um, an email and I'll send you the PowerPoint. Okay, so as we're getting these things down and we're starting to look at our various features of the membership and what they cost our organization as opposed to how they are com uh, perceived by the members high and low value, now what we're going to have is an overlay. And if we look at these quadrants, here's the challenge. If you look at the top left quadrant, it's red. I'm sorry, gosh, wake up, Ed. If you look at the top left quadrant, it's green. What that means is good. 
If you look at the bottom right quadrant, it's red. That means bad. Okay, here's the thing. If you have features of membership that are valued low by the members and are high cost to your organization, you have to really ask yourself, why are we doing these? And maybe those are some things that should be thrown away. The top left is valued high to the members, lower cost to the organization. Obviously, you should be doing more of those. Now, the top right, where it says the aristocratic quadrant, it's high cost to the organization, but high value to the members. So if there are strategic reasons, OK. The bottom quadrant, bottom left, it says sacred cow. It's, it's, you might be going, well, you know, it doesn't cost as much. The members don't think it's that important, but we've always done it. Here's the problem. You're squandering resources that shouldn't be squandered. That keeps you from having more features of membership in the green. Very simple exercise. Now, here's what you want to do. When you go back, you want to do this exercise with your staff. You want to list out all of the features of membership and plot it all over the place. And then don't show them the, uh, this slide until after they've plotted it. See what the staff does. Then do the same exercise with your board of directors. Don't tell them what the staff said. And then at the end, compare. That's going to give you a really good idea. That's going to help you for the next thing that we're going to be doing. Now, how many of you have said membership in our organization is priceless? How many, of you, how many of you believe that? Anybody believe membership is priceless? Yes? No? Or is this the non-participation time? <laughs> or are you still working on that survey I gave you? Okay, here's the thing I want to tell you. I just want you to be thinking about, I don't believe that membership is priceless. I believe that... If something is of value, it can be measured. When people go fall back on that, oh, God, it's just priceless to be a member here, what they're really saying is I'm too lazy, too dumb, too stupid, too you know, unaware to actually figure out how to figure the value. So I'm just going to use that MasterCard commercial thing and say membership is priceless. It's a no sale to the non-members. Also, in creating more value, you need to price everything. Here's the challenge. If you start looking at a lot of your features of membership, and it's free, 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 what do your members think it's worth? Not much. But if you make it available to non-members at a much higher price, and you give it to members free or next to free, then their perception every time they grab it or use it is going to be, oh, I just got a free $50 book. Oh, I got a free $100 report. Oh, I got a free whatever because then they're going to see value. Now, I'm not saying be obnoxious. I mean, how many of you see trade association magazines that are seven pages and they got a $35 price tag on it? I mean, come on, what's that? I mean, it's not being real or honest. So I would just encourage you, look at everything that you're doing and ask yourself, can we put a price on this? Can we make it available to non-members at a very high price and to our members at a low price or no price? And then your board people say, well, yeah, but nobody's going to buy it. Who cares? That isn't the point. The point is changing the perception of your members that a lot of the things you're doing is delivering value. Next thing you've got to work on is copyright. Copywriting. I will tell you my experience, and what I'm getting ready to say might sound rude, my experience is most trade associations and professional societies don't do a great job with copywriting benefit. How the feature of membership makes the member's life better. I got somebody shaking his head going, yep, 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 okay. So, and it's not to be rude, it's not to make a negative statement on anybody in the room, but it's just not what tends to be in your you know, toolbox of tools. This is an area that you've got to work on. So in selling, okay, remember I said earlier, member retention is what? Customer service. Member recruitment is what? Sales. Okay, 
So in looking at sales, there are buying motives. Okay, so people have reasons why they buy. Why would somebody join your trade association? What might be their buying motive? Just yell it out. Education. Education, okay. That's a feature. What? That's a feature, but what, what's education going to give them? Promotion. I'm sorry? Promotion. I'm sorry? A promotion. A promotion. And what's that, Kenny? What's that mean? More money. More money, okay. So the buying motive may be profit or gain, okay? That, that, is, that is one of the major reasons people join trade associations and professional societies is for profit or gain. Not the only reason. It's one of the major reasons. Okay, what's another reason? Fear of loss. If I don't join my association, I'm not gonna know what's going on in the industry and people are gonna pass me by or I'm not gonna know about the, the advocacy or legislative or regulatory climate and then I'm gonna get sued. Okay, fear of loss. That's another buying motive. Comfort and pleasure. Some people find comfort in being in community. Some people join, if we go back to that uh, mark, uh, marketing general, uh, membership marketing study, um, being in community was like a 20 percenter. So some people want to be in community. Avoidance of pain, okay? That's why most guys go shopping February 14th at 4.30, um, to avoid pain. But as far as the, the, the the point is, in North America, people spend $6 billion a year on painkillers. Six B billion. Avoiding pain is a huge motivator. And the pain of not being in the click, the pain of not being in the know, the pain of not having the best uh, benchmark studies, that is a motivator. Love and affection is a motivator. Pride and prestige. Now, a lot of the baby boomers that are members in your organization, pride and prestige is a real good uh, motivator for them because they're just very proud to be in their industry's uh, association. They're proud to put the logo out there. They're proud to have whatever credentials, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, the point, I'm not trying to say which buying motive is important and which buying motive isn't. It doesn't matter. We've got to understand why do people join? What are their motives? Now, the next thing that you're going to do is here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to come up with one of the features of membership that your trade association offers. Just come up with one of the features of membership. It's got to be a member only, meaning stakeholders in the industry don't get it if they're not a member. One feature of membership, okay? And then I want you to write a benefit statement. Now this is a little bit of a long benefit statement. The, the, what I put up here is an example. Feature of membership, and, and don't be lazy and do this one. I mean, do a different one. Um, so access to the headquarter and field uh, office executives and staff. So, so access to the paid staff, okay? You should like this one. So the benefit, how that makes their life better. Two important benefits to consider. One is the sheer time uh, cost savings of getting questions answered by headquarters staff. And the second benefit is the availability of hard to find information. Frequently a call to the association society's headquarter office would save members several hours and more times than not also several dollars into the thousands. Having a daily live person, uh, resource available, can eliminate costly mistakes, potential fines. This is one of the most underutilized benefits. Okay, for those of you that like want somebody else to do your work for you, all of the features of membership that were listed on those slides a few back when I talked about the various features, in the book I wrote a benefit statement for every feature. So go buy the book and it did the work for you. But I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna take you one step further. I'm gonna take you one step further and here's what it is. Pick your feature of membership that you want to talk about, okay? Write it down, then let's go back to the buying motives. And I want you to write a benefit statement, how it makes their life better. Don't just describe what it is. Describing a feature is not a benefit. Describing a feature isn't making their life better. 
How does that feature of membership make their life better through the window of one of these buying motives? Many of your features of membership might be addressed through several buy motives. You know, several people might join for different reasons to access that feature. All I'm asking you to do is pick one of these, pick, a, pick your feature of membership that you have, decide which buying motive here you think is going to be best, love and affection, fear of loss, comfort, pleasure, avoidance of pain, love and affection, pride and prestige. Which one of those buying motives? And again, today, don't worry about doing it expertly. Just understand the process because you'll have more time when you get back to the office to do this. Those of you watching this video, do this. Don't be lazy. Um, then, we'll, then we'll see if there's a brave soul that wants to share theirs in a couple minutes. Everybody understand what I'm asking you to do? Go like, go like that if you do. OK. I don't, there's pencils. I don't see pins. I don't see moving. So if your pin isn't moving, you're not doing it. Well, I guess you might be typing it, you know. Two people reading their email. Three. OK. Oh, you're doing it? Oh, God bless you. Oh, man, you know, you're so much better. I'm a baby boomer, you know? I don't, I don't do that. I have to ask my son how to use my phone. How are we doing over here? Well, you got, you got part of a word down. That's awesome. And hey, you know, if you're here with somebody from your own organization, if the two of you have to work on it together, go for it. It's, you know, it's cool. I mean, it, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, this is your day, not my day. There's no rules. It's, you know, it's all about you guys figuring out how to get the value, or even better, if I can somehow figure out how to tell you how to get the value. That would be even, as we say, more better. Is there anybody that's really comfortable with their benefit statement? Raise your hand. Oh, you got a hand up. OK, wait a minute, wait a minute. Ooh. Did you, you didn't already get a book, did you? No. OK. And what's your name? Debbie. Debbie, Debbie gets a book. Sorry for the rest of you. And, and Debbie, there's the whole section here on chapter 6 all about all the benefits already written out. So it's going to make your life so much better. OK, so if you'll do it loudly so my microphone will catch it, because we don't have a, a mic to give you. Just want me to read it? Yeah, just, just read it loudly. So one of the benefits of uh, being a member of our organization is to apply for the Top 100 Festival and Event in Ontario. OK, so it's a recognition. It's a recognition. OK. So it's pride of promoting your, uh, your event, uh, being one of the Top 100 Festivals in Ontario. Uh, listed and highlighted in the events guide with a distribution of 250,000 and highlighted on our website with over 5,000 hits a month and prestige to stakeholders, sponsors, and municipalities. Okay, so which buying motive did you write that through? Uh, pride and prestige. Pride and prestige, okay. Okay. Now, if you would have written that through profit or gain, how would you have said it? Um, being able to increase your sponsorship through stakeholders. Okay, so, so by, by having, so by telling them, by having this recognition, you're going to be able to make more money. Okay, okay. Very good. But you wrote it through Pride and Prestige. Very good. Excellent. Hey, that was good. Thank you so much. Here's the point I want to make to everybody. It, it's all about thinking differently. It's rather than thinking, oh, let's just write down 
the various features and call them benefits. But let's write down the features, decide what buying motive each feature might address, and then writing copy that's going to address that. Now, whether you, you know, however you choose to go to market, however you choose to recruit, whether you just have stuff online, whether you're sending emails, whether you're printing things, that, that isn't the issue. The issue is copy. Now, my experience is most of the companies that make really pretty marketing pieces make really pretty marketing pieces. That's what they do really well. And their copy, not so much. You know, then most, most marketing companies are not that good at writing good copy. So um, if you find one that is, okay, great. So the key is you need to first write the copy that talks about benefit. Then if you have a marketing company, clean it up and make it prettier and better and sound better, that's great. But you've got to write it, you've got to understand it, because you've got to be able to sell. Was that fun? OK. I'm glad we've got enough time. OK. Let's move to the next one. This is even more fun. OK, so here's, think about this. So you go and you do, you know, you do the work of coming up with the yearly ROI of what your organization delivers based on what the members believe, OK? So that's something that you can put out in the marketplace. Then the next step is you start looking at your features of membership and you start looking at, you know, deciding which what should we keep, what should we get rid of. Maybe we can then boost our ROI numbers, you know. Then we get better at copy. But now you, what you want to do is let's get strategic. Let's lay out a strategy map. So what I want you to do, and again, what I'm going to show you now, it's not about how well you implement this here in, in the room at the table. Don't worry, OK? I want you to go through it as quickly as you can so we have time to do it. But it's about learn the process I'm going to take you through. Don't worry about how well you do it, because you can do it much better in the office. OK? So draw yourself a little grid like this. And what we're doing here is on the left, it says you know, 1 through 10, 1 low, 10 high. That's going to be how well you implement these various features of membership. Across the bottom, you're going to list where it says F1, F2, F3. That's feature 1, feature 2, feature 3. What this is, is what I want you to do is just take your quick perception, don't worry about being perfect, of listing some features of membership based on the left side, what I want you to do is put the features that you think your members value least. On the right side, put the features that you think your members value most. And just go basically as best you can in order from least valuable to a little bit more value, a little bit more value, a little bit more value, a little bit over here to the top value. If you only come up with 10, that's fine. If you come up with 15, that's better. And when you're back in the office, you may come up with 25. So then what you're going to do is you're going to plot after you know, low value feature to high value features. Then you're going to plot 1 to 10 how well you think your organization implements delivering that feature of membership. Okay? How well do you do it? And again, don't obsess on spending five minutes trying to figure out, let's see, should this be up here, down there? You know, if you have people from your organization with you, work together, fine, go for it. But it's all about just as quickly as you can, try to list the features in ascending order, then how well you implement somewhere on here, just put a dot. Okay? So you're going to have something like this when you're all done. Okay? You follow me? Okay, I'll give you a minute or two to do it. I'm going to go over and check this guy's phone, see if he can do this one on his phone. God, that is amazing. I'm always impressed. Oh, man, you kick it. Oh, man, you are awesome. That's great. Yeah, you have to show me how to do that on my phone. Um, what you got? Canadian Marketing Association. Canadian Marketing Association. So are you telling me that your association is all members that are marketing people? And, and should I put you on the spot to ask you which one is the best with 
writing marketing copy? Maybe I shouldn't put you on the spot. It's better that I don't put you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. Although, tell me privately, because that way when people call me up. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions, problems, need any help? I'll rush over to you and, and help you out. Uh, those of you at home watching, I hope you're doing this and not going and getting a cup of coffee, because this is going to help your organization tremendously. So don't flake, just do it. How we doing? Ain't happening. OK. It's hard forcing you to be strategic. Oh, Tim's not doing it either. OK. <laughs> You've done this? OK. You've done this. How are we doing? How many of you have got at least 10 features and plotted on your, your, mat, on your chart? No? 10 features and plotted? When you get 10 features and have applauded, raise your hand, OK? I want to find out where we're going. OK, so those of you, once you've got maybe 10 features plotted, now what I want you to do is go back and do that same measurement how on, on one of your competitors. Everybody has a competitor. Whether you want to admit it or not, we all have competitors. Some other organization could be for-profit or non-profit that people might join rather than joining. So what you want to do is each of those features of membership list on there how well they implement. You know, use a different color pin or put a different symbol, whatever works for you. You know, if you say, oh, I don't have any other color pins, OK, then rather than a circle, put a star or a triangle or something. So what, I, what you want to have is basically two series of lines that you could connect, one that would be your organization and one that would be a competitor's organization. You with me? Generally, when we do this in the all-day format, we do it in teams, and this takes like 20 to 30 minutes to get done, and then we talk about it. Sorry we don't have time in an hour and a half, but I want you to at least understand the process. OK, how are we doing? So as we're looking at this, and I know some of you probably are nowhere near done, and that's OK. It's not the end of the world. Just understand what we're doing. So in a perfect environment, now how often are we going to have a perfect environment? Probably never. OK. <clears throat> so before I put this next slide up, I just want to say, probably we're going to have a perfect situation never. But in a perfect environment, this is what it would look like. Your organization, your, your line would be kind of on the left side, the features of membership that are not real, real important, you wouldn't be implementing them that well. And the features of membership that were more important to your members, you would be implementing better. 
Now you probably wonder, well, why is that? Shouldn't we implement all of them expertly? What do you think? Here's the challenge. Right now, if, if the competitor is implementing the lesser important things well and not implementing the important things well, then what we have is what we call a wedge. We have a competitive wedge. You've wedged between them because for your competitor to differentiate, they have to take some of these other features of membership and do it well so they can be different. But if you know that your members don't consider those real important, you shouldn't be doing the stuff that your members consider less important well. Because if you're doing those too well, you're squandering resources. And you're keeping yourself from doing the things that matter really well, which also allows you to put another wedge on the other side. So in a perfect environment, which we know it isn't going to be, but what you want to look toward is the idea of, OK, if we plot these things out, then you can go back at your board meeting, at your staff meeting, and go, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, let's reevaluate this. Let's consider, perhaps we might be putting resources, too many resources, in areas that we shouldn't. Perhaps we're implementing too well things that are less important. Now, how are you going to find out how important they are? Well, when you do the member evaluation, uh, the ROI, qualitative research, you're going to have a real good idea of what they say various things are worth. And as an example, some trade associations, members say affinity programs are worth zip. Others say they're worth a lot. So if your members say your affinity programs really aren't that valuable, but you're implementing way up here well, you're maybe putting too many resources in the areas you shouldn't. So ultimately, we all have competition. We don't want to admit it, whether it's Google, whether it's a for-profit organization, whether it's a different trade association, whether we're national and they're provincial, whether we're provincial, they're national, whatever, it doesn't matter. The point, we have competition. And if we can differentiate ourselves in a way that we implement really, really well the things that matter and we don't implement so well the things that don't matter, we're going to be in a lot better shape. Does this make sense? Does anybody's look anything like this? You do? Did you win a book? You already won a book? No, I mean, did you get a book? No, you didn't, okay. Okay, this is the last book, this is it. Okay, so let me look at yours. I wanna see yours. I'm just gonna make her prove it, you know? Okay, you win, congratulations. Awesome. Here's the thing, also this exercise, just like the framework for features of membership, you want to go back and you want to do this with your staff and then separately you want to do it with your board. You don't want to show Whoever you do it with first, you don't want to show the others what they came up with. Don't show them until afterwards, because we don't want to influence them. The key is this forces us to think much more strategically as far as we've looked at, we've laid out in a framework what's high cost, low cost, what's high value, low value. Okay, so we've got that understanding. Then we create a strategy map and look at us compared to our competitor and then we build a strategy so that we're delivering maximum ROI so we can communicate to the non-member in an intelligent way, here's how we make your life better. And here's the actual dollars that our members say. So then we have to go into the next step is now if, if you've done all that work, you maybe will go back and if you've made changes, you will maybe go back and redo the qualitative research and do another focus group to see if the numbers change. If they do, well then you're gonna publish those new numbers. Now back to that slide where I said you go, you create the numbers, if you're awesome, go straight into publishing. If not, then um, do the strategic work. Wherever, whichever way you want to go, you want to get to here. 
Now, this is a recommendation. You may have reasons why you might want to produce a different piece. That's totally your gig. But here's at a minimum what I'd like you to do. At a minimum, create a three-fold brochure that gives this information. It fits in a number 10 envelope, it fits in a man's coat pocket, it fits in a women's purse, and that is a tool that your evangelist can use because here's the way the conversation has gone to this point. You should join our association. Well, I really can't afford it. Well, you know, we do a lot of important advocacy work. Yeah, I understand, but I can't afford it. Well, you know, you need to support your industry. Well, thank you, but I can't afford it. And then the member trying to recruit somebody has got nothing else. They're done. Better would be to take out of their briefcase I have this here somewhere. Take out of their briefcase a brochure and to be able to sit with a brochure. Here's just some examples. I'll leave these up here. You guys can look at them. Please don't take them, okay? You know, because these are my only ones, so don't rip me off. But here's some samples of brochures. Here's one that a group just, just produced recently. Well, if we're sitting, wait, what's your first name? Christina, so Christina, we might be sitting, you know, maybe I'm the member, you're the, the perspective, you're the non-member, and I'll be talking to you, and I'll go, well, let me just show you why it might be worth your time to join the organization. You know, my colleagues, we got together, and we listed the various features of the membership, and we came up with what we believe they're worth test. Now, myself, I get a little bit more value than this. These numbers are kind of low. Now, we'd rather have that conversation than the conversation of, I don't know what kind of edibles they had when they were coming up with these numbers. They're out of this world. But we want to, you know, rather pass the smell test, be conservative. And so now I can talk to you about, I'm not, and, and there isn't anything here listed that is a non-member activity. So you can get talking about advocacy, and I go, oh, yeah, yeah, but I'm not even talking about that right now. Let's talk about all the other things, and I can go through one at a time. This is what you get if you're a member. And if you're not a member, these are not available to you. Now we've got a much different kind of a conversation. You need something like this, and, and again, the format is not the key. I'm gonna go through what this format is in just a second and explain it to you. But I want you to understand that, you know, I don't care how you, you know, what you make, but if you have something very, very simple and easy, how many of you, in the past several years have sent out like in a member, a prospective member kit, like 17 pounds of paper? Come on. What basically what you did is you baffled them with bulk rather than dazzled them with brilliance. You just threw a bunch of stuff at them and guess what? That prospective member read how much of that? How much? None? Now in Japan that means something different. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, none. Okay. So, so the, the, the thing is, if you have something very, very simple, you got a better chance that the members are reading. And if you want your current members to be evangelists for your association, you've got to give them a tool that they can use. This is a very simple tool. It makes it easy. So let me just um, put this on the next slide. So in looking at this, it generally says something like membership is a good business decision. They open it up, and in here, it says, what's, what's in it for you or your company? Here are the numbers. In here, it might be more about you and your company. And the very last pane, the very last thing is all the stakeholder value, the advocacy, legislative, and the other activities that you do that is not member only. Because again, 8% of the people care about this to join, so I'm not saying eliminate it, but what I am saying is don't put it on the front put it on the back. Whoop. So in looking at this, here's a layout of how your brochure might look. When we open it up, got the numbers, a little bit about your organization, your front page, hold on, let me, and then I'll get to you. The, the very thing, the very different stakeholders as far as what kind of members, your business, the industry. Yes? Do people, even do, do people do brochures? Smart people do. Well, most of our business is, is national and it's the internet and our young members, we surveyed them. They prefer Instagram, Pinterest, and like the demographics are changing. So that's, that's my question. 
and you're the Canadian dental. You know, it's interesting. I did some work recently, recently for one of the state dental societies in the southeast of the United States. I won't say which one. And they produce this really cool video to get people interested. But the video was all about, here's how to be significant. And when I asked them, I said, who's this for? And they said, well, new members. And it's like, well, new members, you know, where, where's, your, where's your best chance for new members? Well, the doc's right out of school. Well, hey, they can't be significant because they're not even successful. And so they, they built the whole wrong and then the wrong information. And then they put it on a DVD. And as you said, most younger people would rather have it on YouTube. However, you've got to remember, what are we doing with this? Now, sure, you're going to produce this as a PDF, no question. That, that's, that's, that's a no-brainer. That's obvious. However, if you're going to have your current engaged members, see, the question is, do you want your staff to do the recruitment, or do you want your members also to do the recruitment? If you only want your staff to do the recruitment, well, then maybe sending something out doesn't make sense. But if you want your members also to be recruitment, to become member recruitment evangelists, they need a piece of paper. Well, our members actually do it through social media versus sharing. So they share links, they share information, they share video links with the same information but in a different format than a traditional brochure. That's fine. I mean, you know, if, 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 if you are different than 99% of the associations out there, cool. Do it your way. You know, it doesn't matter how you choose to do it. You know, I don't want to get into a discussion, well, this is the right way, this is the wrong way, because there is no right or wrong. But I will tell you this, for the majority of you in this room, you're going to need a piece of paper. Because your members, especially your baby boomer members, want a piece of paper. Yes, you want it as a PDF. Yes, you want it to where they can have stuff to, to put into your social media. But they want a piece of paper because I can sit in Starbucks and have a cup of coffee or Tim Hortons, and we're sitting next to each other, and I've got something to talk about, rather than me pulling up my tablet or my phone and having to, to make it work. You know, do what works for you. It, it isn't, it's less about getting into an argument about the format and more how do we create the information that they're going to need. This is the brochure. OK, now, whoop, I have to leave this up here for any of you guys to look at. If you want, like I said, please don't take it. Next topic, the campaign. Now, once you've got your information produced, however you're going to produce it, I will tell you one of the very effective ways to kick off a, a member get a member campaign is to have this brochure. And you got little bundles of 10 rubber band together. A bunch, enough for every person in the audience. And then you're going to have your keynote speaker, your kickoff speaker. So just for topic of discussion, remember there's only one keynote at every conference. That's the first speaker. So you're going to have your first speaker, the keynote speaker, kick off the conference talking about the organization. They're going to weave that in. Usually a discussion on strategic alliances works really, really well. And then we can talk about the trade association being one of the best strategic alliances that all the members can get into. And then basically you get the speaker to you know, get everybody all riled up about you know, how they, if, if the association were to grow what's in it for them, how it's going to make their life better, what are the things that the association can do with more members. You know, get the people involved to see why it's in their best interest. Because a lot of association members go, I don't want to bring everybody in. I don't want my competitors in here. I don't want everybody to get the value. So we have to get past that, get them motivated, and then get everybody to make a commitment that they're going to you know, go out there and talk to their colleagues. And then have your board members or people come down the aisles like ushers in church and rather than ask for money, hand out little packets. Get everybody to commit that they're going to give these out. And guess what? About 20% of the people will actually do it. The other 80% are going to blow you off. But right now, how many people do you have out there? So if you want to do this in a way 
people have it in their hand, they walk out with it, and their commitment is to go talk to 10 prospective members, 10 colleagues, give the brochure out. Then afterwards you have your board members or whatever committee follow up with the people. And it isn't about beating people up. Hey, did you do this? Did you do that? It's more about, hey, do you need any more brochures? Do you have anybody that's interested that we need to have the, the headquarter office call the people to make the sale? You know, every organization's a little bit different. Then the last thing to be thinking about is, oh, here, let me put the steps up, sorry. I went through the steps, but I didn't put them up. There they are. The last thing is just getting you to think about your member recruitment model. Now, how many of you in the room are out selling door to door? Not too many. That's kind of the chamber of commerce model. Selling door to door is really, really good. It's very successful, but you have to pay a lot of commissions and probably you're not gonna do it. Uh, it's kind of like telethons. Telethons are a little bit like selling door to door. The only problem is if you bring people into your organization through a telethon and you bring 50 people in in, in a couple days, you better have an assimilation uh, process in place because if you don't have an assimilation process in place, I guarantee you of those 40 people you brought in, probably 38 to 40 will leave the next year. That's not a good thing. So your second is gonna be a marketing approach. Now, for some organizations, and here's the challenge, and we got the, the, the marketing association here, he's not gonna to wanna to hear this, but marketing general's uh, information proves that, that marketing is not one of the top reasons for people to join your website and, and, and member get a member are top reasons. So you need to be careful that if you just do internet marketing and mail out marketing, be careful that you have metrics to determine how good it is, because otherwise you're just sending out, it's of no value. And then the last is really the member get a member. I think that the member get a member is, oops, one more. The member get a member is really what you wanna do. And we could talk about that in ad nauseum, but we're pretty much out of time. So what I'm gonna leave with you is this final thought. There's, what was the first thing that I suggested to you that I want you to get out of this? See, see your organization through the eyes of the non-member. What was the second thing? Measure the ROI. What was the third thing? Talk about benefits, not features. What's the fourth thing? Get your members to become evangelists. Here are some resources that you can access at no charge. I'm gonna leave that up. There's all kinds of good things um, that are available to you. Here's the bottom line. If you do the work to figure, measure in an intelligent way the return on investment, how many dollars back does your member get, what your members believe, they get back for each dollar invested? you'll have a different conversation to talk to the non-members about. The conversation you're probably having right now is not as successful a conversation as a here's what's in it for you conversation. I would highly recommend that everybody in this room explore the possibility of having another conversation for your members. With that, we're done. Leave your card if you want the PowerPoint. Have a great day.